I'm Tom Gualtieri. And I'm David Sisko. Welcome to series two of Draw the Circle Wide, which explores the need for more equity in the theater. In each episode, we interview a gifted Broadway performer, having in-depth conversations about their life and their work as an artist, and what needs to change in the industry. Then we craft a song just for them based on their interview. As our industry continues to have long overdue conversations about race, equity, and inclusion, we want to use this series to celebrate performers who come from communities that have been underrepresented in the theater and create work for these artists by listening to their voices. We can build a beautiful city. In today's episode, we speak with Ahmed Maksud, the charming and talented actor who has appeared on and off Broadway in television and film and regionally at some of the nation's most prestigious theaters. A graduate of ART, Ahmed had been rehearsing for the new musical The Visitor at the Public Theater before the lockdown and after his work in the Tony-winning musical The Band's Visit, which David and I absolutely loved. Ahmed's candor and grace made this a conversation where it was easy to talk about challenging subjects. A self-described proud Egyptian American, Ahmed gave us insight into facets of the entertainment world that haven't been discussed nearly enough. And we think you'll find this conversation enlightening. A city of from uh, from reading just a little bit about you that you had a very adventurous and creative childhood and I was just curious to find out um, what or who fostered that that kind of curiosity and that adventurousness. I have to say my parents probably they were the first of each of their families to leave the country they were avid travelers before I was born and uh, took me to lots of different parts of the world as well. Um, I remember once they came uh, to stay with me in New York, up here in Washington Heights, and they had come back with, you know, Dominican baked goods and uh, stories of different restaurants that they'd explored, uh, you know, people talking to them in Spanish, thinking they were, you know, part of the community here. Uh, So they've always just been kind of uh, fearless in that regard. And I think that's where I get that spirit and that energy from. The earliest performances that I can remember were of those American Girl scripts that came with the dolls. So I had uh, uh, friends of mine in the aftercare program that I went to would bring the scripts in. And then I guess one of the supervisors just kind of fostered us creating them. But I was the only boy who would participate. So I ended up playing all of the uncles and dads and everything. Um, And I, yeah, I think that's that's how I got into performing specifically. Uh, My family didn't, necessarily (laughs) encourage it at first. They warmed up to the idea of me being an actor and an artist later in life, but that's where that, that started. And I think, you know, I think that that creative energy and that sense of play always existed. Um, And I just, that was the avenue that it funneled through given that opportunity. I I double majored in psychology um, and at first, it was a concession to my family. I had originally applied to undergrad programs for biology. And when I got to orientation for uh, at Northeastern, which is uh, ultimately where I ended up, uh, I freaked out. And there was no room for any extracurricular in the program that I was in specifically. I chose uh, psychology as a complementary major initially, again, to you know acquiesce to the pressure of having to pursue some science. But... I think it it feeds into the performance work pretty significantly. Theater and performance deals pretty heavily with uh, abnormal behavior. That's where a lot of conflict and drama stems from, you know, uh, from traumatic experiences that these characters go through. So, you know, having an understanding of of what the, how that would manifest in a person um, and what sort of influences would dictate, you know, what behaviors people exhibit uh, was, was incredibly useful. Your social media is really active and it's very specific. 
And you and I had a conversation about it at one point about sexuality and about um, about uh, yourself as a type. And um, one of the things that we discussed is like sex positivity and, and sex shaming also. Mm -hmm. And how does that um, fold into your work as an artist? I'm sort of specifically, I guess, looking toward you as an Egyptian American and how exoticism and othering of mm -hmm. other cultures um, can lead to sex objectification, but also how beneficial that is to some of us as performers. And I think in your Instagram feed, especially, we get to see a lot of you. It's very sexy. It's very attractive. And I feel like that's part of the thing that, that you're using. It's a skill that you're using as a performer to drive your career a bit. There's this Oscar Wilde quote that's only loosely related, but I always point to it. Uh, and he says, everything is about sex, except sex. Sex is about power. Um, and really, I mean, it is. Sex is about, about power. And I think uh, owning our sexuality can give us a lot of power. And particularly as a gay man coming from an Egyptian community, uh, one where homosexuality is really uh, subdued at best, if not out outwardly discriminated against, and I think part of claiming that power, particularly in a performance space or in a really visible medium, is owning my sexuality in that way. I'm reinforced by that when I get messages uh, occasionally, you know, through Instagram from other Arab men who are like, thank you for being so visible with your sexuality. This isn't something you get to see all that often. If I'm in the driver's seat of my sexuality and I'm the one making those decisions, then uh, the, the impulse to exoticize me uh, is something that I'm in control of, uh, something that I can, I can sort of shape. Like I, I've almost chosen it as a superpower in some sense. Like if, if I can own it, then I can manipulate it in ways that, that serve me uh, as opposed to ways that, that subjugate me. So my name is something that always uh, gives people trouble, right? It's, it's, as far as Arab names go, it's very, very foreign sounding, right? Ahmed can, can be really aggressive and there are sounds in there that don't exist in, in English. So um, often I'm caught in this like cycle of, of how do you say your name? No, I want to pronounce it correctly. Like, will you help me? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and to a certain extent, I get to decide how that conversation goes. Uh, so there's, there's an element of power there, right? But that suddenly people, it's not something that's ever dismissed, right? We often just take people's names as they are, but mine is always a conversation. And that can often frustrate me because sometimes I don't want to have a conversation about my name, uh, constantly, but I also recognize when I step outside of that frustration, that it's, it's something that gets people talking to me, right? Uh, in a way that they might not with someone whose name is Sam, um, um, and it'll invite a lot of questions about my background and about where I come from and, and all of that, that I get to decide how much I participate in. Um, it, how I respond is a consequence of my patience level on that day, but, but I do recognize that, that it is a, a quality of mine um, that other people are fascinated by. My actual, uh, my full name is Ahmed Hamdi Mahmoud Abdel Masood for whatever it's worth. <laughs> so is there a moment in your life that you feel, or, or anything that you think would make a great song? Something that you've always wanted to sing about or an experience or just a subject matter? I think, I, I really just think this idea of fractured identity, right? Is, is, is a great song idea. Um, and, and like a first generation experience. I, whenever I think to create my own work, it, it always comes down to what it's like to have foreign parents. And it doesn't even, you know, the specifics of where they're from are not even as exciting to me as just this idea of being in America and being American um, and having parents that are from elsewhere. Uh, that's yeah. something that I share, you know, with, with, you know, some of my Chinese American friends, some of my, mm -hmm. you know, Latino American friends. I've often talked to them about how we have to negotiate that. And, and there's very little visibility in our media 
for the, this experience. You know, throughout the interview, we talked about kind of perceptions of how people, you know, what people assume he is like based on, um, yeah. on how he presents, right? And I don't, I, the song should not be about that in particular, but there is something in that duality of, you know, he's a very strikingly handsome man, right? And I think that is a common trope. It's like, there's this really handsome guy. And so we put our image of, of who that person is on, on them. Yeah. And then he's like, no, but I'm actually this, right? I am this, but I'm also this too, right? And I, I, that is something to me that seems more universal that could be interesting to have him sing about. Yes, and I'm not ignoring you or typing a letter to my mom right now. I'm actually making notes on my okay. Hi, mom. Tell her I said hi. Um, <laughs> you're in a chat room. I know. It's okay. Oh my God, what is this, like 1997? Seriously. Um, yeah, so that's, I like that idea, um, and I think that there's there's something that can there's something both comical in it and um, and true, right? Yeah. Well, I think things are only funny if they're I think they're funnier if they're true, really. Absolutely. Um, so yes, I can see going with that. But it's like a song that I could envision, like Jeremy Jeremy Jordan singing, or like there there are lots of uh, you know, and that's the purpose of these songs, right? Is to make sure that they have that they um, they are applicable to other people. I, yes, I think the purpose of what we're doing is, and it's funny that we're talking about this because ultimately I think we want to just write songs and create content for people who have typically not been at the center of a story, right? Yes. But I think what we're starting to learn is how much more universal these stories are um, and that Ahmed being Egyptian, he talks about in the um, interview about how we paint the view of Middle Eastern men, particularly Egyptian men, a certain way, and that what he is versus who we think he is are different. Yeah. I know from reading about you that you're interested in answering for yourself, where do I belong as a first generation theater artist? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about places where you felt like you haven't belonged and mm -hmm. how do you overcome the cognitive dissonance of that in those moments? How do you uh, move beyond that? As a, as, as a first generation American um, and uh, as any first generation or might describe to you, we occupy a really unique sp space that's that's really not often explored, and it's this sense of of having a private ethnic life but still being American, right? I, I don't I don't know much beyond my American experience. My my cultural understanding of Egypt is is really quite peripheral. It's what I got from my parents at home. It's not uh, anything that I, I you know I, I might have spent my summers there, but I didn't I didn't I wasn't educated there. I didn't grow up formally there. So there's a division between, um, you know, what my experience growing up is like and what other people assume my experience is based on how I look. For much of my childhood and, and even into my early adulthood, that sense of where, where do I belong? Was, I mean, that was a really a palpable question. And so or feeling like I didn't belong at home um, as a consequence, both of my sexuality, but also because I had a different cultural perspective from my parents was tough. But then in, in more public spheres and in my American life, um, constantly being questioned about my, my ethnic origins and about my cultural experiences and, and having the assumption that I'm not actually from here. I mean, the, the question, where are you from? When I answer with Boston, Massachusetts, as I'm sure you've heard constantly, is usually met by, no, but where are you actually from? So, you know, that, that also generates the sense of where do I belong? If I don't belong with the Americans and I don't belong with the Egyptians, um, I don't, you know, where am I supposed to go? I'm going to lean into how I can be most visible and say, look, this is who I am and I'm here and my identity is all of these things um, and it can exist in this space. And that, that takes 
it's taken me quite a bit of time to discover that, that where I belong is essentially where I choose to belong and, and where I um, create my own community in my own space. My, my experience in a, a sort of divided, uh, from a divided cultural lens allows me to recognize that, that I, I have that power. You know, much of my work has been a consequence of my ethnicity and my my look. And I think that that's ultimately a flaw in in originality and casting or in, in playwriting. And, I, and, you know, of course, in this moment, there's a bit of a reckoning with how we're how we're perceiving those things, um, which I'm grateful for. But. It, it, you know, it, it takes more than just asking the questions, it takes recognizing that, you know, people like me are American and we have these, these sorts of experiences. Are there examples in your career of that happening to you where you're cast in a role where you, you don't have any uh, cultural association with the character, but because of what you look like, you're cast in the part because you physically seem to fit? Yes, well, all of the terrorists I played on television, of course, um, yeah. are certainly <laughs> an, a, a really extreme example of that. But I have conversations with a friend of mine about this quite often. Uh, we, whenever we do see Arabs represented, even in, in, uh, you know, less villainous contexts, there's still an element of swarthiness of, of, you know, uh, masculinity of, of mystery. Um, and that's just not who I am. You know, I'm, I'm like a wacky, uh, you know, sort of intellectual, um, irreverent sexual guy. I'm, I'm not this uh kind of you know tough exotic you know kind of dark middle easterner so i'm often asked to manifest that and to go against my own impulses to play the stereotype of what we think these arab men are like the hook is fair the idea of the title of the song is fair Fair, I never said these things, and fair, I see your point of view, and fair, I see that you look at me as a certain way, but you don't see X, Y, and Z about me. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that, that is more, um, that could play into this kind of more fun um, idea musically is, you know, it's like this kind of come and get me, like, you say you want you say you want this and you say you like this about me and you want this. Well, then come and get me. Come and discover the real me. This is what you're going to get with me. I'm a fairground. Like fair, fair. Okay, you want a fair? I am a fair. I'm a carnival. I'm a Ferris wheel. I'm a oh, Jesus. I'm a ride you can I'm a ride you can get on and spin around. Like it could be sexy and a little dirty. Oh. <laughs> Look carousel at, you can ride look at you turning a hook like it's your job mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's, then it's it's like your cake and your pie and and all the desserts can you we kind of get it <laughs> no seriously we kind of get it all in there yeah and it's yeah. still it's the thing that's really i like about it is that it's it has a sense of, of attitude and playfulness but what it's saying underneath is it's serious get your life right and come correct <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's essentially what it's saying. Yeah. yeah. You were in the Off Broadway, the Broadway, and the National Tours of the Band's Visit, which mm -hmm. I think I can say for Tom and I was one of our favorite theatrical experiences in the last five years. Wow. Uh, have you talked a little bit about the significance of working on that, on that show? Yeah, I'd say the most immediate one was an introduction to the musical landscape of that those cultures in that region. Um, we we never get to see that kind of music uh, on a Broadway stage in particular, but even more generally, it's not it's not in our um, you know cultural ethos. I think that just the the overall structure and the nature of the show and doing something really really human and um, not um, you know, not terribly spectacular. It proved that we can have a show uh, like the band's visit and have it be successful. That if we really consider 
um, the humanity of the people on stage, and if we uh, if we're really detailed in our you know behavioral decisions and the way we write these people, and um, and we're you know shameless about how little even that we we share overtly. You know, so much of the show was in either Hebrew or Arabic. And if you weren't a speaker of those languages, then you didn't necessarily know what was going on, but you could put those together. And there was there was value in not knowing. You know, part of what was so exciting about the show was that you weren't told what, what those conversations were. So it was really important for me to get to experience that and to hear audiences talk about that. Um, and I think for Broadway as a whole, it, it's a really valuable thing that I got to do. Musical once, and uh, there it was a, a workshop, and there was a moment where someone was buzzing up to an apartment building. But in Egypt, um, there aren't there aren't buzzers. Every apartment building has a doorman, a uh, web, and it's like a very cultural Egyptian thing that um, you know who the web is and what kind of relationship you have with them, and they would uh, introduce someone into the space. So. There are those, you know, kind of minute details that are often overlooked. I think that there's so much change that needs to happen at the level, at, at the educational level too. And I'm wondering if you had similar situations in terms of how you were seen and how you were cast mm -hmm. at the educational level. So in grad school, I went to ART for grad school, and I never played a Middle Easterner, right, at, at all in my entire experience. I think the only the, or at least I was never assigned it. The only time I did was for my showcase scene, which I had selected. Um, but there was no education about what my what the business experience would be like for me. That these were would be the roles that, uh, especially initially, I would be going out for. Um, and I wasn't prepared to experience that level of uh, you know narrow casting to a degree. Any time you have uh, you know in an education setting a class of individuals from certain parts of the world, it's critical that at least a part of the curriculum, you know, a, a fraction of the curriculum recognizes their attendance and their presence in space, and that there is room for them in the industry. How we, how we might approach a role or what methodology we might use can certainly be influenced by, um, you know, our own ethnic experience. I think the way that some, you know, a, a black actor would approach an August Wilson piece is going to be very different than how they might perform something written by a white person, and and for those of us who you know who are within demographics that not, aren't necessarily as uh, as well represented in what we get to see on stage, um, it's really important for us to work on that material at least a little bit. And I didn't get any of that at any point, you know. I remember I was having a really tough time once and a friend of mine, she said, sometimes when I'm, I'm low, I just think about uh, how big the universe is and how small I am on this planet and how small the planet is in, in the galaxy. Um, and I get some comfort out of that, that there are things that are so much bigger than us. And uh, I, I find that inspiring, you know, um, that like, that there are so there are so many worlds within our world, and there are so many stories uh, that we can explore. And and so I think just getting to be in a physical space like that often will remind me and, and push me forward. You know, he talked about this other idea that I liked, which is going outside for inspiration, going to the stars, looking at the big wide world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if that's inside him? What if that's the thing he wants his partner to see, right? You, you see this thing on the surface, but if you come inside, you're gonna see that there's all this expansiveness in here that is much more than you think from the oh God, surface. That's so beautiful, Tom. I love that. This is something I was playing with with the chorus. It's not, it's nowhere, I don't know. It's, it's not what I want it to be, but. What are you talking about? It's nothing. You're such a jerk. I feel like it's really corny. I'm gonna reach into the screen and slap you, silly. 
I'm going to read this aloud so you can actually receive it. Okay. <laughs> I've got a world in me, a galaxy, a night sky waiting and wide. I've got a space for you, a Xanadu, but you have to come inside. That is not, that's exactly what the song should be. Okay. All right, I'll go with you. <laughs> so crazy. Can we do a double chord? Like, every, like it just makes me laugh because literally every time you write a song, you're like, oh, I just wrote this. It's horrible. <laughs> so stupid. Like, oh, no, yeah, it's just horrible. It's only the idea of the song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I already have a musical idea for this. Oh, all right. All right, then. I've got a world in me, a galaxy, night sky waiting in wide. I've got a world in me, a galaxy, a night sky waiting in wide. Oh, see how smart you are. Mm. Yes. And then repeat. I've got a word. Because then, then it would be different words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had one action item, one proactive step that we'd want people watching this video to take, specific to equity in our industry, what would it be? I would say give those of us who experience any sort of discrimination or disenfranchisement the benefit of the doubt that what we're telling you is our experience. Um, I think often we rely on our, what we know as being true to be true for everyone when it's not. Um, and when I think there's, there's sometimes in that defensiveness a bit of suspicion about what our what what people's motives might be for pushing their agenda, quote unquote. Um, but this is our experience, even if it's not other people's. And so I would I just want to say, give us the benefit of the doubt that what we're saying is real and what our experiences are like is real. And what we need is not uh, as hard to deliver as it might seem if you're just willing to participate. I had a great time talking to Ahmed. He's so easy to talk to. Yeah, and super intelligent, right? He's got this very. intellect and makes his points very seriously, carefully. But there's that sense of humor there that I love that peeks out every once in a while. And, and uh, uh, you can see it in contrast on his website where there are tons of pictures of him doing charming and funny shows and video of him being funny and then there's his reel where he's playing a lot of serious characters. Um, and uh, he's even joked about playing so many terrorists. Um, but I wanna bring that comedy out and that joy that he has in his song. I really responded to him sharing about his experience being a first generation uh, Egyptian American and the assumptions that um, Egyptians have made of him and assumptions yeah. that Americans have made uh, of, of him and his, his life and how that separates them from him and him from them. And it's, and it's, it's an experience, I think, that it goes back in our country, you know, many decades. The country, especially in the early part of the 19th century, there's so many immigrants coming in, right? Immigrants of different groups and they all get isolated and it's happening again. Yeah. And uh, how do we fix that? How do we change that in the country? It's one of these conversations we have to keep having. Absolutely. We'll be releasing the premiere performance of the song we wrote for Ahmed in a separate video. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel below. If you're interested in finding out how to be an ally, please check out the resources in our description also below this video. With Draw the Circle Wide, we are committed to shining a spotlight on equity and representation. And we hope this webisode has inspired you to draw the circle wide in your own life.